New Retirement Survey Income. How do U.S. investors stack up against the world? And is Evolve Technologies the next big AI play? Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Thursday, April 4th, 2024 edition. I'm Justin Klein, and I'm joined almost as always with uh, Luke Guerrero. And I know, Luke, you are excited about the final four matchups in the Invest Talk Market Madness tomorrow, right? I am, but you know what makes me more excited? You know what Thursday means? Uh, tomorrow is Friday. Tomorrow is Friday. Okay. And uh, the fireworks in markets today make uh, makes tomorrow's market even more interesting, as well as the uh, the jobs data that comes out tomorrow. So uh, that's kind of the near term what's happening. But uh, what's most important on this show is the long term about your financial future and your uh, your investment portfolios and your education, your education about what makes sense for you and your situation, your, uh, your long-term goals, uh, and how today's market applies to those ends. So we are here to answer your finance and investment questions, give you as much data and perspective as we can, developed with over 20 plus years of investment experience. And if you, of course, your calls are welcome, 888 chart is the number. Now, before we get any further, uh, let's talk about the Elite Eight, that was today, and we have champions of each region. And the we have new econ- the final four. We have the final four. The new economy champion, Cytokinetics. Cytokinetics, oh. biotech name. Uh, and then our our favorite, Core and Main, the Core champion Main. of the old economy, just relative strength 97. Okay. Uh, so that continues its strong momentum. Cytokinetics, even though it's been in a general pullback over the past couple of uh, months, uh, it's 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 emerged out of the new economy region. I think a lot of that has to do with the other names not doing so hot. Cytokinetics kind of hanging in there. Uh, EQH, which is Equitable Holdings, that is a mid cap in the consumer region. That was the champion there, and then uh, the final matchup was the income region AES which is a utility company, and AES will match up tomorrow against Equitable and Quorum Main against Cytokinetics, and we'll do some previews later in the show. Now, I ensure you, uh, to ensure you're in the loop, make sure you download each podcast every day and get the daily results. Now, Luke, before we head over to talk about the market, as well as run down the show topics, we're going to hit our first caller question now. Hey, this is Andy from Atlanta. I was trying to call you guys about ticker symbol NI, and that's Knee Source Incorporated. I just wanted to see if you could check the fundamentals on this one. I've been holding it for a while. It's kind of been um, just left to right, and uh, wanted to know what your analysis is. Big fan of the show, and I'll listen for your answer. Thank you. Are you looking at Nye Source? This is uh, mid cap. Let's call it a utility company, $12 billion market cap. They operate in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Kentucky, Maryland, and Massachusetts. About a 4% dividend yield here. It's just been kind of going sideways. Relative strength, 41, not terrible, not amazing. You know, one thing everyone has to understand about utilities is that there's not a giant difference between most of them. You know, there's some outliers, ones that maybe poorly run or run into some major problems. Think of, uh, I think here in California with uh, Edison, right? Um, And the fires. Um, But in general, most of these utilities, they perform very similarly because they're bond proxies and, uh, you know, there's there's small differences in their overall growth. Um, But Luke, what are you seeing on NYSource's valuation compared to uh, itself uh, historically in the industry? Well, uh, you know, in terms of its valuation, it's about at its five-year average, it's trading at 1.6 price to book. Price to forward-looking earnings is a 15. Again, it's difficult to do relative valuation on these utilities like we talked about yesterday just because of the model of the business. I also want to, I believe it was Pacific Gas and Electric who had those fires. I ah, think it was you're PG&E. Right. I don't want to besmirch right. my local Southern California Edison out here in case we have any listeners there. You're but, correct. I misspoke. 
but yeah, you nailed it. I think I think utilities generally, like I said yesterday, I don't get very excited about. I think it's interesting to note on a day like today in terms of uh, market performance when AES, for example, was up 1.2%. Uh, this name was actually down 62 basis points. People tend to fly to, to utilities, which are bond proxy income proxies in terms of market stress. So that's an interesting thing to note. So you know, generally, like you said, there aren't many differences between them. Um, they've been paying a consistent dividend yield over the past past five years at right around 3.3%. Uh, but but I would question just how it's performed relative to other utilities, especially on a day like today, before I would throw some money at it. Yeah, it, it, it it's a fine utility. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, it the re- Interesting enough, the relative strength of the utility sector is 41, exact dead even with what uh, NYSource is. So it, it's just performing like the overall industry. It's fine, I, but... Like we said yesterday, you're not going to get excited about uh, pretty much any utility out there. Now, we have a lot of ground to cover over the next 40 minutes or so. And our main focus point is about a new survey. And it's not just surveying U.S. citizens. They also surveyed those from around the world, 500 from each country, from about uh, eight or nine different countries. So we're going to look at the statistics there and how... U.S. citizens match up against their foreign counterparts. We also have some other topics on the docket. One is in regards to oil refining capacity. A new report by Wood McKenzie, which is a uh, which is a consultancy agency around the energy uh, economy, uh, and it's talking about the potential for certain refineries around the world shutting down. And why is that? And we're going to talk about that. Also, if we have time, private equity, private equity, or or those that own private equity are starting to unload and unload at a discount. And they went into it thinking one thing, that they're getting one thing, and they many times got another. And so we'll look at that as well. So those are the topics on the docket for us, as well as your voice bank questions. One is on BioNTech and Blue Owl Capital Corp, which we'll get to those calls later and most importantly, your finance and investment questions at 888 chart Now, Luke, let's take a look at the market today. Uh, throughout the morning, everything seemed fine, but some comments by some Fed officials, I believe it was Kashgari, uh, basically hinted at potential for zero rate cuts by the end of the year. And that was the catalyst for a market sell-off that in a market that was, you know, even talking about being overbought and, you know, when you're that overbought, there's always, uh, it's easier to, to trigger a a market sell-off. And that's what we got. We closed at the lowest level really since about March 19th, not that long ago. Um, but certainly was a big wide ranging from technical perspective, reversal bar on volume. And this looks to be the start of, at least a, a reasonable pullback in markets, five, seven percent. We're already probably down two percent from from the highs, so probably some more downside in the near term. But a uh, very interesting, interesting day. What was your take uh, as we closed on the lows? Yeah, I don't know if I necessarily agree. The driver of uh, of the turnaround, it certainly was a whip. So I was up for most of the day and then quickly dropped. I noticed that while it dropped was about the same time that crude oil spiked. Finished the day up 1.4 percent. So you know, a lot of people are also attributing this to uh, the potential and rise in tensions in the Middle East. There was a report earlier in the day that the U.S. was letting Israel know that within the next 48 hours they expected an Iranian response on Israeli soil. So I think maybe as that took a little more steam throughout the day, uh, like I said, oil swinging up at the same time that the market decided to dip. I think that probably had a hand in it as well. There were a couple other Fed officials who also also spoke and said that you know things were were staying the course. Um, uh, you know, Harker said inflation was still too high. Barkin noted that the data has been less encouraging, but they still seem to be on course. Goolsby said disinflation's trend remains similar. So I think there's a lot of things out there that could have caused this. Um, only time will tell with the jobs report tomorrow and with some more Fed speak and, and Powell, I think, speaking next week as well, uh, what the course of, of the Fed's, Fed's path will be. But certainly some more hawkish language today that was a little bit unexpected. Yeah, there's uh, there, there's there's always multiple headlines that could be the catalyst uh lockheed martin up today so you know you're seeing defense money flow in the defense contracts like you said oil prices up so uh yeah that definitely could be and that could also 
uh, if you see oil prices surge, that would give credence to the other side, which is, hey, inflation is resurging and the Fed won't cut yeah. by the year, the, uh, year end as well. Um, and you also have to remember, too, from a liquidity standpoint, we're entering a time where people are doing their taxes. They might need some cash, yep. selling some securities and and sending that out of the financial system and, and to the uh, government coffers that takes money out of uh, from the liquidity uh, situation. So um, that's another factor that most people don't think about. I'm not going to hit the headlines, but we're certainly in that uh, you know final couple of weeks here until uh, tax day. So a lot of factors that could spark a, a market sell off. But whatever the factor was, we got one. Uh, and it certainly looks like we're we ready for at least a, a modest pullback in markets. Like I said, five, seven percent. I think that would be frankly healthy. It's it's not a healthy market when you go up, you know, kind of consistently uh, holding the 20 day moving average uh, for multiple months now. And you kind of need a refresher. So you get a few people scared. Um, and I think this is probably a a healthy thing over the next couple of months to have a market uh, shake out, pull back, um, but probably most likely a buying opportunity in a, an election year where typically markets go up, right? Yeah, no, typically it does. And, you know, <clears throat> if you're a long-term investor, any dip is really a buying opportunity. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's keep things moving and pivot to another Talk listener. This one came in earlier at 888 chart Hey, can I have your opinion on buying this ETF for a long-term investment? F-I-W. F-I-W. Thank you so much. Bye. F I W. I've got a lot of questions on this one uh, lately. This is the First Trust Water ETF, and it corresponds to the ISE Clean Edge Water Index. Clean Edge Water Index had a reversal today, like a lot of the markets. What are you seeing, Luke, on, on your side for this particular ETF? It will split pretty evenly between large and mid caps. It's about 41% in large caps, 49% in mid caps. The top 10 names make up about 40% of the fund, and it only holds about 30 names. It's relatively cheap, I guess, for a pretty concentrated ETF that is certainly active. It's 53 basis points. But the fact that it's in primarily U.S. large and mid caps tells me that that's kind of expensive for me. It only holds 37 names. You might be able yeah. to mimic this, uh, you know, cheaper. Um, it's not one of those broadly diversified 100,000 name ETFs that gives you asset class exposure. Yeah. Um, you know, from a from a performance standpoint, it's been pretty decent over the past, you know, three years or three months. It's been up 10%. Year to date, it's up 6%, which for a specific ETF of this nature, Sure, might be might be pretty good, but you know, overall, I think for me, because of how few names it holds and how simple the strategy seems to be, it seems a little expensive. Yeah, I agree. Fifty three three basis points is uh, kind of a lot for a a niche ETF like this. Uh, and like you said, fifty three fifty four percent of the portfolio is in utilities. Sorry, not utilities, industrials. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's and I like that part of the, the market. I like that part. Uh, and so I, I rather just own utilities uh, you buy the XLI that has a expense ratio of nine basis points. So I think that's a much better way to go. You're going to get some of that water exposure in there along with a lot of other parts of the industrial space that's doing very well right now. And it has much better relative strength. So I would go with XLI over FIW. Now, our main focus point is a survey by CNBC's International Your Money Financial Security Survey. And it was polled 500 people in about nine countries. And we'll first start off with the results from the U.S. About half, a little over half, say they're behind schedule in their retirement planning. And what's interesting here, Luke, is only 54% of Americans had a retirement account as of 2022. And the stand, the typical balance, the average balance, $87,000. That's the median value. Okay. Uh, so not the, not the average, but the median is 87,000. And what's even most concerning, and this is according to the Vanguard group, those between the ages of 55 and 64, what we would be consider pre-retirees, mm -hmm. the median is only 71,000 in their 401k plans. Now they, they might have IRAs and things like that, but 
that's not that's not a whole lot. Um, so what do you glean from this survey besides those raw numbers? Well, it's certainly a little distressing, I think, for a lot of Americans who are approaching retirement and have found that they haven't been able to, haven't had access to, or just given their cost of living, haven't had the opportunity, or some irresponsibly not reti- not saving at all for retirement. I also think it hints to the bigger problem here, which is a lot of people in this country solely rely on Social Security, which is something that you know, uh, I don't think is, is in as dire straits as some people lead you to believe politically, but certainly it isn't something that you should wholly rely on. Yeah, I think three it also and brings, four expect to rely on government support in retirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think it also brings about the question, or rather the, the other issue, which is not everybody has you know, the great access to 401ks, right? The lack of standardization through private market plans means that not all 401k plans are created equally. We see it all the time. Yeah. And some so great ones, is, some terrible ones. Exactly. And I think this is certainly a big issue that affects a lot of people, not just because it affects the individual, but down the road, it affects the public through public spending and something that needs to be addressed. Yeah. And, and especially if you look at it compared to other countries, So the eight other countries they looked at were Australia, France, Germany, Mexico, Singapore, Spain, Switzerland, and the UK. And the best country out of those, France, 74% of respondents felt confident in their retirement plan, 70% in Singapore, look at this, 65% in Mexico, 65%. So we're, we're, we're trailing behind Mexico. Uh, Switzerland's at 59, 58 for Spain, 56 in the UK, 51% in Germany, and 50% in Australia, all higher than the 47% here in the U.S. You know what a lot of these have in common, though? What? Public health insurance. Mm. One of the largest costs for individuals is health care. Especially yeah. as you grow older, you're spending more and more on healthcare. So, you know, this could lag, hint towards people feeling as though they're not securing their retirement, or it could just be insecurity related to the rising cost of healthcare, which is one of the largest contributions to inflation. Well, and the fact that about half of workers don't have access to a 401k plan. Yeah. And we know that pensions are no longer standard anymore, and it's moved to a defined benefit program like 401ks, 403bs, et cetera. And that is everyone's best saving mechanism because it's so consistent and a lot of people don't look at it. They don't think about it. They just continually save and never hits their pocketbook. And in the long run, that is a the best savings mechanism for the average worker. So that's why several states have launched the auto IRA program. If you don't have a 401k plan, you, you basically uh, are forced to set up IRAs for your employees. So uh, I think that's a step in the right direction, but certainly doesn't solve this gap in retirement preparedness. All right, let's let's uh, let's pivot over to a question that came from our YouTube channel. I hope you know by now we are doing every show on YouTube. We're, we're recording it, we're posting it a couple hours after each show, so you'll be able to see uh, all the videos and, and uh, you'll be able to see all the charts and things that we're looking at. And this question, Came from Ulam Spiral and says, I've lived in Australia for a number of years, still have some stocks there. Do you have any insights on Australian stocks, Australian dollar uh, that near that's nearing a 20 year low? I believe I'm thinking about closing these positions and transferring money to the US, but it doesn't seem like the good time to do it. Now, Luke, when it comes to currencies, a lot that impacts the movement of currencies, everyone talks about the interest rates, prevailing interest rates in those countries, and that certainly is a factor, but also the strength of the overall economy. Uh, and Australia is heavily reliant on commodities. And for many years, they were heavily reliant on the Chinese economy, exporting raw materials to China to be used in manufacturing, building, uh, etc. And now the Chinese economy is not doing so hot. So uh, that certainly is uh, an issue. Um, but now you're starting to see resource prices go up. And that's definitely good for Australia. So I'm inclined to think there's actually more upside for the Australian dollar in the short to medium term. What are your thoughts? No, I do agree. And I think this is typically the time when people feel desperation to get out of investments where they've been down, right? Mm-hmm. But they, we're talking about a macro picture here that affects the Aussie dollar, that affects the Aussie economy, and therefore Aussie stocks. And given what their economy is primarily driven by, now might be a time that you actually want to be in. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, the Australian dollar actually bottomed last October, and it's actually making a series of higher lows, higher highs. Not a strong uptrend, but definitely now neutral instead of uh, a downtrend that it had been since uh, early 2021. So I don't think it's a great time uh, to be unloading uh, your Australian stocks or your Australian dollar. Thanks for the call. Hello, Steve, Justin, and Luke. Um, this is Paula from Gatorsburg. Today, I have a question about BioNTech. It actually caught my eye because I heard somewhere that they have like so much cash on their balance sheet. Um, usually, I'm not really a fan of uh, pharma industry. And uh, I know the COVID vaccine is over for them, but they have a lot of products in their pipeline. And uh, what really caught my eye is that they don't have much debt and they have almost as much cash on their balance sheet as their market cap. So I was asking myself if, if it's not like a yeah interesting investment for, let's say, the future for the next five to 10 years. Interested in what you guys think about it and I'm looking forward to hear about it on the show and as always i uh, love to listen to your show and i'm um, looking forward to it thank you all take care bye-bye are right, looking at bio and tech and this is out of germany and they partnered i believe with pfizer right on yep, pfizer yep um and uh, you know they made a bunch of money for the original vaccine and that as profits continue to trail off last quarter revenues down 64 percent earnings down 79 percent and for this year and next year they're supposed to return to a loss like they were for pretty much their history before 2020 hit so that's the issue here um and the uptake in vaccine the the the, the boosters has done not nearly what people had hoped and frankly i'm a person i took I took this vaccine and I have an autoimmune condition uh, because of it. So um, it's not major, it's minor, but it's still a thing. And you couldn't pay me to take a booster. So I think a lot of people maybe not feel as strongly as I do, but similarly. And so you see that with the Pfizer, trend of Pfizer stock, Moderna stock, BioNTech. They're in a downtrend for a reason because the uptake of the boosters is just not there. Now, the caller is correct. They do have a lot of cash in their balance sheets. Somewhere 12, 15 billion. What are you seeing, Luke? Yeah, around 12, 13 billion. Yep. On a $21 billion market cap. So that's basically saying, okay, the, the business is worth roughly uh, eight, or, eight or nine billion there, um, which for a expected money losing company for next year, uh, that seems pretty expensive to me. Um, I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts, Luke? Yeah, I mean, you know, they were they were a one trick pony, and uh, yeah. for the company, the the trick seems to be uh, seems to be gone now. Uh, they're not going to be making the forty dollars a share that they did two years ago, um, but they do have a lot of cash. So I guess your the question for the caller would be, you know, this is probably a better, rather a better protector of your capital than most biotechs that are just burning through money. Um, they well, probably, it seems like they're they, expected to burn through some money, right? If you're well, they're expected to burn money through again. money, but but a lot of biotechs burn through money by taking on debt and then burning through money. Yeah. If these guys want to burn through their money, at least they have the cash. So I'm yeah. never a fan of biotechs generally, right? Um, mm -hmm. This is probably not as bad as most of them because at least they're not in a bunch of debt and they have a bunch of cash to play with. But is this where you should put your capital? I don't think so. Yeah, and, and really... You're, as you said, they're one trick pony. So you either buy into the mRNA platform or you do not. That's your, that's really the question here. If you do, you think that you know it has other applications that are going to be fantastic, then this is a good name. <laughs> uh, but if you don't have faith in that platform, then you know you want to avoid uh, this name. All right, let's go to Frank and San Rafael looking at EVLV, EVLV. Evolve Technologies, you own it or looking to buy it? I'm looking to buy it. I just heard some news on the, on one of the programs one time about they got uh, uh, some method of uh, of uh, uh, finding guns on people in New York New York subways. I was curious about that. Interesting. Okay, so this is a 
very small cap company, $737 million market cap. They provide AI-based touchless security screening systems for weapon detection, identity verification, etc. cetera. Uh, I haven't heard that story, but an interesting one. This company has never made money. Um, you know, I'd have to... I would never buy anything, though, just based on one headline I don't m- know much about. So it sounds like you read a headline. I would really need to dig into it deeper, um, but certainly not okay, a company that has very good it's fundamentals. It's never made any money, then. It's never made any money. Never. Never. Okay. Well, Steve always said to stay away from those companies, so I think I will. And I wish the best for them, too. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'll definitely pass uh, that along. Uh, did have a nice spike recently, but yeah, it's a it's a poor business, and I don't know if this becomes the standard in the way to detect uh, weapons. You know, maybe, but uh, that's probably not the case. Right. Now, Luke, let's talk about the final four. Not the final four let's this weekend of both. You know, the men's and the women's uh, basketball uh, matchups are pretty intriguing this weekend that's that's exciting but i think for most of our listeners it is the matchup between cytokinetics and our friend core and main now cytokinetics core and main cytokinetics did get through the final four by the skin of its teeth it had actually a down day at dollar 74 uh whereas core and main it didn't have a great day it was also down um overbought so both of them definitely reversed which one are you taking are you just sticking corn with main. corn main <laughs> corn main there's no fundamental technical reason it's just my gut my gut is telling me corn main okay yeah and like you said you're not a big fan of biotechs typically cytokinetics is not a money winning not not a money making company it's 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 money losing and so i'll go with corn main as well mainly because if we do start a market pullback and we have, you know, some negatively interpreted jobs numbers tomorrow, uh, certainly Cytokinetics is likely to sell off more uh, than Core and Main. So I, I'll go with Core and Main as well. CNM is the symbol. Uh, and then our final matchup in the final four is Equitable Holdings, EQH, also down a little bit today. And going up against AES, which was actually up over 1% today, d- despite the market sell-off. So definitely a flight to safety there with AES. So you have a utility company uh, going up against really uh, an investment company, a financial services company, similar to you know our business. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'll, I'm going to go with AES mainly because if we do have a follow-through tomorrow, those utility companies tend to hold up better because they tend to be bomb proxies, right? I, I agree. I think that if tomorrow's jobs report comes in at consensus or better than consensus, yep. there will maybe be a little bit of a follow through from the Fed comments, maybe some deterioration on the macroeconomic picture, and the the flight to safety trade would definitely benefit the utility. So, yeah, I'm gonna go with the utility here. Yeah, all, all depends on how the market reacts uh, tomorrow. Do we get a follow through day? You know, or was today just one day and and market freaked out over uh, the similar things that we talked about uh, this uh, to start the show. But uh, or do we get a a snapback uh, or sorry, a continuation uh, to the downside? Uh, I think uh, that's certainly a potentiality as well. So uh, we shall see. Uh, I will go with AES and core main as well as my prediction for the final on Monday. Now, Luke, let's talk a little bit about the oil industry and more specifically the refining industry. And this is a an interesting recent report from Wood McKenzie. And they looked at 465 different refining sites around the world, 465. And they identified about 121 of them, about 21.6% of global capacity that are at the risk of closure. Now, this is the risk of closure, not like... Uh, they're going to close tomorrow or predicting all of them are going to close. Just saying that the economics of them closing uh, is as elevated. And they see them mainly in Europe and China. And Europe because less cheap uh, input inputs from, say, Russian oil and gas. As well as in China, they're electrifying their auto fleet. And so... 
you know, is that something that uh, could push the demand for uh, liquids in China down uh, and the profit margins and cash flow in Europe and European refineries down? So what what did you make of this report? I think typically with reports such as this, the answer is, again, somewhere in the middle, right? I think people over-anticipated the extent to which electric vehicles and renewable energy would have prominence in the world in 2024. Electric vehicles are not caught on like some people hoped and thought that they would. So do I think that generally oil refineries Some are going to close as oil demand is drawn down. Yes, that doesn't mean that oil demand is going away. It just means that it's being drawn down. So does it make sense going forward that some oil refineries in some some of these countries are going to close? It makes sense to me. I don't know if it'll be to this extent or as quickly as some people assume, but it certainly makes sense that that would logically happen. Yeah, I I think my issue with this report is the continued belief that transport fuel demand will decline. Uh, And you just see as the last couple of years, there've been a lot of EVs sold throughout the world uh, and demand for transport fuels, mainly think oil that you put in your car, diesel that Luke puts in his car. You you drive a diesel, right? I do drive a diesel car, 50 miles to the gallon. There you go. Uh, So, you know, those, the demand there has been, uh, believed to shrink, you know, it's always going to shrink and, and go negative uh, in the next three, five years because of EVs. And then it just doesn't happen. And we've talked recently about the low demand for EVs this year and going forward in the environment where uh, consumers are a bit more stressed. Uh, you have uh, the uh, you have uh, interest rates uh, going up, so it's uh, more expensive to finance. Uh, and, you know, those that have $100,000 to burn, they've kind of bought their EV and there's not a whole lot of uh, a demand on the lower end. And so uh, I think it's pretty clear that uh, the low hanging fruit of those that will buy EVs is mainly exhausted. And now it comes down to how do you incentivize people uh, on the lower end of the spectrum to go buy EVs and, and increase that uh, that, de- that demand growth on the EV side. And I just don't see it. And so uh, that's why I think the economics in most for most of these refinery, refineries will remain solid and robust, um, especially because typically they find other uses for some of these fuels, um, especially if the prices go down. Now, where I do think there will be some shut, shutdowns will be in Europe uh, because It's no the input costs uh, for oil and gas are are no longer dirt cheap like they were when they were importing a lot of that from Russia. And so uh, and then you have the economy generally in Europe relatively subdued, slow grower. Um, So I think that's where probably the biggest risk to uh, shutdowns are. You're already seeing uh, European oil refineries uh, shut down uh, one from any ENI as well. as That's an Italian uh, oil company as well as Shell, they're shutting down one in Germany. So interesting story here that could affect the broader oil industry. Now, 2024 is humming along, and we are now into the second quarter. The first quarter what? is behind us. Can you believe that? Wild. We're over order of the way. Even it's a, even it's a leap year. You know, we had an extra day in that first quarter, and it still went by fast. And, you know, the big question for our listeners, Luke, is – are they ready? Are they ready for these times? You're already seeing that now. You're seeing the price of raw commodities, industrials, the the old the old economy in in in, uh, in best stock market madness vernacular. The old economy stocks, they're doing fantastic. The new economy stocks, not doing so hot as of late. And you're starting to see uh, those trends that started really in 2022 reemerge. And the question is, are you ready for these trends? Is your portfolio prepared? Well, if you need help, please take advantage of our free portfolio review assessment via telephone or go to meeting by heading over to investtalk.com and fill out the portfolio review questionnaire. You can get to it by just clicking on the button on the top right-hand part of the screen. Now, this is Invest Talk with more than 58 million downloads, and our work continues with this caller question. Yes, my name is Josh here in North Carolina. Love your show. I had a question about a stock, HTGC. Hercules Capital. 
uh, purchased some positions of this last month. Uh, just kind of watching it. Don't know if I should hold it uh, or sell it in lieu of what we're seeing going on with some of these commodity prices. And I have a lot of positions in oil and uranium uh, and did not know if I could free up some cash uh, by selling it and moving into those. Uh, would appreciate your opinion. Thank you very much. All right. Looking at HTGC, Hercules Capital. This is a BDC company. They invest in privately held technology and life science companies. 8.8% dividend yield. And this uh, investor is probably looking at that yield. And my immediate reaction is run, sell, get out. This is already showing uh, some negative divergence on the chart. And anytime you have an 8.8% dividend, that's a red flag. And then my third red flag is privately held tech and life science companies, biotech companies. Uh, this is not where you want to be. And, and I think those harder assets are certainly going to outperform. What are your thoughts, Luke? Yeah, I will say their dividend has been pretty consistent in the 8 to 11% uh, range over the past five years. And the returns did start to diverge at the end of 2019. But it doesn't seem as though that may be the indicator of why you should run for this company. I think the second point you made was, which is it is investing in tech companies. And they probably better uses for your capital. Pretty high, pretty high multiples in those private markets. So, yeah, you can do much better. You're not going to get the 8.8% dividend, but you're going to get probably much better total return. Thanks for the call. Hey, Justin and Luke. I'm looking to add to my income portfolio and uh, came across Blue Owl Capital Corporation, ticker symbol OBVC. Uh, it's trading at about uh, $15.40 right now. Seems to push out a nice, nice dividend. And I wanted to get your thoughts on the company itself, if it's sustainable, if it's a decent addition to a portfolio that is based on income. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts and love what you guys do. Thanks so much. All right. Well, first, I want I want you to back up because I think this would teach uh, a lot of people out there is you need to have portfolios that are not just based on income. You need to be, have a portfolio that is based on good quality companies, good quality businesses, not just income. Income should always 100% of the time be secondary to the underlying business. Now, let's take a look at this one. Blue Owl Capital Corp, OBDC. We had a caller about a BDC company that was focused on tech and biotech, it looked like. This one doesn't seem to have an emphasis, uh, but that also makes you say, I don't really know what they own. They do lend to middle market companies, and that can be of higher risk. But we also know, Luke, as of late, uh, of the past five, 10 years or so, people are chasing yield, and a lot of the lending has gone to uh, these uh non-standard uh, forms of, of financing. And there tends to be looser underwriting standards. Um, and that allows them to grow their book, to grow uh, their business, but it also increases the overall risk of these portfolios that are ultimately driving this dividend. So do you think he should be as worried as we were about that previous caller? Well, I think that's something to consider. Certainly, I think the hidden debt within the system is a problem that can blow up in a really bad way, primarily because of those loose standards. We found time and time again that loose lending standards lead to catastrophes. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that strikes me is with this company, their sales growth seems to have stalled a little bit. They had some great growth between 2021 and 2022, but that's kind of tapered off a little bit. And so... I think it's pretty fairly valued. I don't think it's undervalued. I think you tend to want to buy great businesses that are undervalued. Um, and to but me, this just... It's, it, it's hard to know what's, like you said, that's fairly valued, but you don't know what's in the True. portfolio, right? True. So did they lend at egregious valuations? Did they lend to poor businesses? That's the hard part. To me, I, I look at these as extremely high risk bond funds. Yeah. That's what they are, right? They're high, think of a, a high yield uh, bond fund, but to companies that can access the public markets. Most high yield bond funds that you're buying, they're filled with with companies that 
do have maybe poor balance sheets, leveraged balance sheets, but they oftentimes have still access to the capital markets, meaning they can borrow more. They can uh, issue more stock. They can uh, borrow from uh, banks and and, and uh, issue new bonds, et cetera. Uh, whereas these companies, they're smaller. Uh, they're not your little mom and pop. They're in the middle market. You know, they still have millions of dollars in revenue. They have a business there, but the quality of that business is obviously not up to uh, the par to go public. And so, um, you know, that's the issue here is it, it looks sexy, um, but you go back to 08 and you saw a default cycle and a lot of these companies uh, get into trouble and the dividends get cut. So I'm just not a huge fan of these BDCs. I think there's a better risk versus reward by buying a high yield bond fund, which you're not going to get 10%, but you can still get, you know, right now, six and a half, seven, maybe seven and a half percent. Uh, and you're going to be, I think, much safer in a credit downturn. Does that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. And I think you also, you know, I think people tend to think of dividends as, oh, we have this money coming in now, and you want to live off of the income from these companies. When, you know, you generally, if you are investing in companies because they're great businesses that might not even pay dividends, you get to kick the tax bill down the road, right? Mm -hmm. A dividend is forcing you to pay taxes and the share price goes down based upon how much money the company is uh, giving out in a dividend. It's not like you're making free money here. So I think people have to reorient themselves. Yeah, and if you look at the history of the, the dividend as of late, basically since near the end of 2022, their dividend has been uh, going up and down from three cents to 33 cents, back to four, back to 33, back to six, back to 33. So, you know, why aren't they paying that dividend consistently anymore? I think that's a big, big question. So uh, I would definitely pass on Lou Owl. Thanks for the call. I'm Justin Klein with Luke Guerrero, and this completes another Invest Talk program. We thank you for listening. We encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And be sure to rate on iTunes as well. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. Invest Talk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1-800-557-5461. Steve Peasley is president and Justin Klein is chief executive officer of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial. Thank you for listening, and your comments and questions are welcome on our 24-hour listener line at 888-99-CHART.